Hello, thank you for joining us for Adventures in Producing. My name is Wendy Mitchell. I'm doing this series to talk to amazing independent producers. And we've got one of the best here. We have Manette Louie, who is a New York City born and based producer, has done so many amazing films. Um, the Tale, Land Ho, The Invitation, Swallow, I Carry You With Me, dozens more that I won't uh, name check here. She won the 2013 Independent Spirit Award, Piaget Producers Award. Uh, she now has a company called The Population that she founded with Molly Asher and Derek Wynn. So, Manette, um, I, I don't think we've even met in person. Um, I, yeah, I was trying to remember if we did or not, but we know each other so well through social media. Yeah, I was going to say we're Facebook friends, which is more important than being real. Yeah. Um, but you're somebody, I just think you're so important to this independent film community. Uh -huh. And you, you too, I, Wendy. Well, I, I, thank you. Yeah, so thank you but for I, having me. I, you know, I, I feel like I know you because anytime I need to have a sort of U.S. amazing kick-ass producer to interview for a story or to invite for a panel, I just always email you and annoy you. <laughs> so now we get to hear more about your career. Cool. So, um, first question is, how did you get started in producing? Um, I think your first official credit on IMDb is a, a co-producer on Mutual Appreciation, Andrew Bujowski's Film. No, actually, my first credit is as a production assistant on a short film called Brighter Days, which was an N NYU thesis film starring Mark Duplass and by a filmmaker named Godofredo Astudillo. So it was my first time on set. Uh, this was in 2003. Um, I had recently quit my job in corporate media. I worked at um, sportsillustrated.com and Time Magazine. Um, I'm a Time Inc. veteran myself. Are you really? Time Inc. custom publishing and then uh, Entertainment Weekly. Oh my goodness. Maybe when we would have met in the cafeteria. You worked in the Time Life building? Yeah. Yeah, so did I. Okay, I mean, fun. This is, yeah, in the late 90s. So basically, once 9-11 once hit, I was like, what am I doing with my life? You know, growing up in New York, I was always interested in filmmaking. I'd see film sets everywhere. And I was particularly interested in the producing side of it. It's like, how does that whole circus come together? Um, but I didn't know anybody in the industry. My parents were uh, immigrants from China and Hong Kong and not connected whatsoever. And um, so I had no idea how to even enter the industry. And so 9-11 happened. I was like, you know, what am I doing? I need to, I want to try this film thing before I get, you know, too old and I can't do it anymore. So um, ended up PAing on an NYU student film. I answered a random ad um, and uh, was, was working. In the Village Voice or something, I hope? No, no. it was the um, mayor's office of <laughs> film, television and broadcasting. It was called at the time. Now it's called something else, but, um, but it's basically like the city film commission's office. And so they put out this weekly list every week um, to, to say which productions were happening, including um, job listings and things like that. So basically, but it wasn't a job, it was like a volunteer opportunity really. So I just, I was like, okay, I'll try this PA thing. And uh, so I PA for three days on um, an NYU film in a Jersey City motel. Um, and it, I just fell in love with it. I was, I was like rubbing coffee grounds on a dirty bathroom wall. And I was like, this is great. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, and I met, probably half a dozen people who I still collaborate with today. Um, you know, they're well, all- You worked on quite a few shorts, um, kind yeah. of throughout your career. It's it's not that you worked on a short and then moved on. Um, so yeah, how did you keep working on shorts and finding yeah. them? Well, after that experience as a PA, um, you know, NYU at the time didn't have a producing track. It only had like a writer director track. And so they needed producers. So a lot of times these outside interlopers, I basically got a free NYU film education by crashing NYU film sets. They needed producers. So like basically I met a bunch of filmmakers. Uh, I ended up producing three NYU thesis films um, just based on connections I made on that one film. And that's how I learned producing by like doing it phys physical production for these short films. Um, and then my first feature was what you mentioned, uh, Mutual Appreciation by Andrew Pajalski. So that was also- Did you meet him? I know you went to Harvard and I think he went to Harvard. Did you meet him there or did you meet him through this NYU? No, okay. I met him in a really random way as well. So, you know, as I was sort of 
expanding, trying to figure out who I might know in film. I was reading Filmmaker Magazine one day and you know how they had the 25 faces of indie film. Um, I saw this woman who I had Chinese class with at Harvard. Her name is Irene Lutzig and she's a documentary filmmaker. And so I emailed her, I found her through the alumni database. I'm like, hey, I see you're in this Filmmaker Magazine. I wanna learn more about filmmaking. And she's like, okay, but I'm about to go to Russia to shoot a documentary and it sounds like you wanna do narrative filmmaking. So uh, why don't you talk to Andrew Bajowski? Um, so, so she introduced me to him. We met for coffee in Williamsburg and he needed help on his first feature. And so that's how it came on to, to mutual appreciation. Cool. Yeah, what do you the, think about the M word, mumblecore? Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was bizarre how it sort of blew up, you know? I mean, it was really, it was that film that sort of started it. Um, I mean, Mumblecore started earlier, but that was the first film um, that our, the sound guy, Eric Masunaga coined that term. Um, and uh, I think it was a South by Southwest 2005 where they had the puppy chair and one of Joe Swanberg's movies and then We Show Appreciation. And somehow that movement just sort of took off. Um, yeah, because I was working at IndieWire at the time with Matt Ross, who knew Andrew from Harvard too, I guess. Uh, so I was, um, yeah, introduced quite early on to Andrew's filmmaking, which I thought was really cool and different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Children of Invention, this is a film, 2009, Zee Chun yep. directing, and that seemed like a er very early pivotal feature for you. For Can sure. you talk a little bit about that? And it had an inventive distribution strategy as well. It did, out of necessity. <laughs> we were children of invention <laughs> on the distribution side. But yes, it was my first film as a lead producer. You know, on a Mutual Appreciation was my first feature, but I was just a co-producer. And it got into Sundance, which really just sort of opened the door, blew the doors wide open. Um, and, you know, Z and I were very sort of, um, systematic about trying to expand our network because we both you know came from working class immigrant parents and didn't know anybody and so we made sure to attend every party at Sundance and we were there for all 10 days and just really built our network at that one Sundance, Sundance 2009. Um, and the reason why we ended up self-distributing that movie was because you know Sundance 2009 was the probably I hear it was my first Sundance but everyone said it was the most depressing Sundance because it was right after the Lehman Brothers crash of 2008. Right. And um, so all, a lot of distributors at that time went belly up, um, you know, like Paramount Vantage and Warner Independent, all these labels were just gone. Um, and so nobody was buying, first of all. And the ones who were left were, um, you know, weren't paying any significant MGs. So we did get some offers, very small offers. We even had zero dollar offers. Um, so we just decided, you know, let's just figure out how to do this ourselves because, you know, a lot of people didn't know how to market or distribute an Asian American film mm -hmm. anyway. It had, it's an all Asian American cast basically. Okay. Um, and so uh, we decided to use the festival circuit as kind of part of our distribution, you know, and use the, all the local publicity that comes with festivals to try to sell DVDs. So we basically printed a bunch of DVDs for a dollar and then we would have these screenings, do our Q and A's and say, hey, anybody want to buy a DVD for 20 bucks? So we'd make $19 on each DVD. Um, and we actually make quite a bit of money this way. Um, nice. Did, were you also getting screening fees from the level of festivals that you were yeah. at? Or yes, a little bit. Yeah, we got screening fees. I mean, that's the thing is once you get into Sundance, like you get invited to a lot of other festivals, your fees get waived. Um, not only do your fees get waived, but you can start charging for, you know, five hundred. Yeah, your submission fees get waived, and then you can yes. hopefully get a screening fee. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So yeah, we we did that, and then you know from that, you know, it clearly ge it generated a lot of interest. We had got a lot of great reviews on the fest festival circuit, and then we ended up getting nine distribution offers. You know, by proving that there was a market for this film. There was an audience for this film. So um, we, I think we took like two or three of them and pieced together, piece, like I took a VOD deal and a DVD deal separately. And I licensed the film to like PBS. And you know, it was kind of all over the, it was a patchwork distribution, um, but the film got out there, you know, and then it, it got on Amazon and Hulu and iTunes and it's still available now, so. And do you have any DVDs left for 20 quid or 20, 20 bucks? I do and have some in my attic. Okay. <laughs> They're probably all warped and melted, but I still have them. <laughs> Uh, and I'm probably skipping around chronologically, um, sure. and we're not going to go every film because you've done too many. Um, <laughs> but you were all, you were co-producer on Natalia Garagiola's Hunting Season. Yeah, uh, beautiful Argentine film. Um, how did you get involved 
with that? Yeah, it's um, it, so I was running a company called Game Changer Films for a while. Um, it's, it was basically the first uh, film fund specifically geared for uh, women directed narrative features. And so during my time there, we, uh, we financed 10 feature films of which Natalia's was one. Um, it was actually our only uh, non-English language film hunting season. And so uh, I think, I don't remember how I met the, the lead producers on that are these great Argentine producers, uh, Ray Cine, who also produced for Lucretia Martel. Oh. So somehow we got introduced to them and uh, it was a very, very low budget. It was mostly made up of, they had a lot of soft money from Argentina, Germany, and France, and they just needed a little bit of equity. Um, and yeah. so we thought it was a great opportunity to support um, a first time director, um, do our first foreign language feature. And we fully recouped from that because it sold to Netflix after Venice. It won um, Venice Critics Week. And uh, yeah, so it was it was nice because Game Changer at the time, um, I was basically ran Game Changer from 2013 to 2018. And that was when Netflix was actually buying finished films at significant prices. Um, they still do that occasionally, but you know, they, they, they do a lot more in-house production now, but they were doing a lot more acquisition then. And, you know, Game Changer um, was also one of the reasons I was always stalking you on email. So, you know, it, I thought it was so important that it was, you know, uh, real money being put into feature films, as you said, by women. Yeah. Um, were you there from like day one? Did you help set it up? Did you come up with the concept? How did it all start? Right, yeah, I didn't found the company. I was not one of the founders. The four founders came from the documentary world. And um, one of them, Dan Kogan, who I'd worked with before on Children of Invention, actually, Dan Kogan was running Impact Partners, which financed Children of Invention. Um, when they were looking for somebody to run the company, uh, I was one of the candidates and, you know, um, and they hired me, thankfully. And um, so I was basically hired, but I did, you know, um, set it up. I did like figure out what the structure would be and do all the, the fun legal stuff to set up the company and just figure out the recruitment structure and everything. So, um, so yeah, so, and so I started before we even had the full financing to go. So I basically closed all the financing. Um, and then the fund was set up. It was only meant to last for three years, basically, because we raised a set amount of money from 36 investors. And the goal was to invest it over three years. We, we did a we invested over three and a half years. Um, Cause you know, it was hard to find films that checked yeah. all the boxes, like, you know, women directors, the, the script had to be great. The, um, there had to be both a critical and commercial value. So it was hard to find sort of the, the perfect films. And, uh, but we found 10 great movies that I'm super proud of. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think between the 10 films, we have like nine independent spirit nominations and um and actually six of our 10 directors didn't have uh, agents before we made their films and five of them got agents um the six is actually natalia who didn't want an agent like people were pursuing her but like yeah so it was it was great because you know i think it just the films we made they weren't all first features most of them were not first features but they still um really helped the women um step up in their careers Okay. Was Land Ho part of Game Changer or that was separate? That was Game Changer. It was, I, it was a film that I was producing that I brought to Game Changer and it happened to be the first film that we, we financed through Game Changer. And so I was both a producer and a financier on it, which was weird. Um, yeah. And you know, I'm obsessed with Iceland. Um, you're aware <laughs> of this because I was, again, stalking you on email because I was writing a book yeah. so last great. year about Icelandic Filmmaking or filmmaking in Iceland, and we included Lanto. But what was it like shooting in Iceland? So I didn't get to go because um, because I had just started running Game Changer at the time. Um, I did have two great producing partners, Sarah Murphy and Christina Jennings, who were on the ground with our directors, Aaron and Martha. So I was basically like, you know, producing from the computer. So I handled all the legal stuff and oversaw post production and sales and everything, everything else that was not on set, you know? Um, so sadly I did not get to go. Have you been to Iceland now? No, because- Okay, we're gonna, gonna go. get you there. I I'm really wanna go. Yeah, I didn't, I couldn't go. I was gonna go to the uh, Reykjavik Film Festival okay. when Lynn Ho was playing there, but I was, had conflicts. I was producing, uh, producing something at the time. So I need to get out there. Yeah, it's a magical place. And Christina loved it so much, she moved there. She so. moved there, yes. <laughs> I love it. 
Um, obviously, one of the game changer pivotal projects there was the invitation. Mm -hmm. um, what were the, the challenges of that film? Did Was uh, it sort of obvious that it was going to be amazing? I thought it was obvious it was going to be amazing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Karin, it took her seven years to get that film off the ground, which was so surprising to me because it's, to me, the clear home run it's a genre movie you know but you know she she was basically in director jail after making eon flux and prior to that jennifer's body um which you know there's articles about what she went through on on these films um and so it was really hard because of that because she was in director jail so it was a million dollar movie and you know still nobody wanted to do it and so uh it was brought i can't remember how it came to us i think either you like her agent sent it to us or XYZ sent it to us, but I fell in love with the script immediately. And um, and what was challenging about it was we had, um, we were gonna finance 50% of it. And then we had another financier who was gonna come in for the other 50. And then at the last minute, they sort of said, hey, we can't do full 50 anymore. Um, we can only do 25. So that happened twice. That happened on the tail as well. So yeah. both times the other financier just sort of like either dropped out entirely or dropped out a significant amount. And so, you know, we, Game Changer and the founders and I had to kind of scramble to figure out how we were going to find the additional financing or decide to put in, in both cases, we decided to put in more, but um, in the case of the tail, we actually went out and looked for financing, which is why I have a producer credit on the tail because I became a, way more involved than, um, I expect it to be. <laughs> yeah. I've heard a lot about the tale from my friend, Saul Bondi. Um, uh -huh. yes. Yes. But I, yes. I think it's such an important and just a stunningly made film, but yeah. Did it take a while to get all that back together or fully financed? I mean, it, it, it didn't take that long because it couldn't, because, um, uh -huh. you know, we had, a schedule to keep with Laura Dern and Common and or Ellen Burstyn, like everything was set to go. So we kind of, the financing kind of fell through at the very last minute. So we, we were literally scrambling and we almost decided not to do it because we were like, this is so risky. Like, you know, what do we do if we can't find the rest of the money? We can't go in, you know, with not, with not all the money raised. And so we did find some commitments last minute, but then we, we ended up working with a financier who shall remain nameless that um, ended up sort of like not putting in as much as they had promised. And then they were later in uh, last year or two years ago, were indicted by the DOJ for fraud. <laughs> okay, everybody can Google and figure that, that one out yeah. to yeah. not bring on to your next film. Yeah, exactly. Um, Buster Small Heart was another great one from Game Changer. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how the team discovered basically Rami Malek, that was his first notable role of that size, I think. Yeah, well, Sarah, well, actually, I'll, I'll tell you how I discovered Sarah. Uh, <laughs> we met at a, the director, Sarah Dina Smith, um, we randomly met at a cocktail party at LA Film Festival. She was standing alone, I was standing alone, we just kind of got together. And we were considering financing another one of her films, a, a bigger film, but that didn't come together. And then she went to um, a screenwriting colony and, and wrote this one. And it was a very weird movie, Buster. It was like, um, yeah. it wasn't a full script. It was sort of a, a script mint, I, I would call it. Like it was about 60 pages of uh, short story scenes, a sketchbook. It was very strange. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, some of, our, some of our investors were like, what is this? Like, what do you, I'm like, just trust me, it's gonna be good, it's gonna be good. And so um, it was in very low budget and, and we didn't have an actor at the time. So, uh, you know, we kind of went through, it was written for a, a Latino actor. And so we had a whole list of Latino actors who were considering, and then we're like, okay, why don't we expand it and um, have it be some kind of brown actor, you know, um, <laughs> Middle Easter. Um, so, so that's when we started thinking about Rami because um, Sarah and Sarah had seen him in Short Term 12 and was, uh, and uh, what is that movie called? Was it the, uh, the mini series about the war wasn't he in a mini series i think he was in a mini series and so she saw him she saw him in various um, projects and really was a fan of his and so when she brought him up um i remembered him short term, short term 12 as well so um and then we heard that he was going to be in this show called mr robot which hadn't come out yet we had no idea how big it was going to be but we're like well he's going to be the star of a show you know which might take off so 
let's take a gamble on him. And, and Buster ended up being, I think the first um, lead role he's ever had in a feature film. Wow, yeah. Um, look at him now. Amazing. <laughs> uh, so what was the last film during your tenure at, at Game Changer? We had three films that premiered at Sundance in 2018. So it was The Tale, Nancy uh, by Christina Cho, starring Andrea Riseborough, and uh, The Long Dumb Road by Hannah Fidel. So those are the three um, last ones. Okay. And then why was it right for you to leave Game Changer? I think, obviously, we should say that Game Changer has sort of relaunched. Yes. Since, run by the magnificent F.E.T. Brown. And they yes. so that original sort of three-year thing way gone, um, it's something new now. But why was it right for you to go off on your own after? Yeah, I mean, you know, our, our, the first the first fund did well, you know, I mean, we ended up recouping across this slate of 10 films. Um, and I was hoping we could raise another round and keep going with some tweaks to the model. You know, I, I thought it was a good model, but you know, I thought we could do some tweaks. And, you know, I think the founders and I just sort of disagreed on like the direction of the company. So um, we parted amicably and I kind of wanted to do my own thing anyway. And like, I wasn't a founder, you know? And yeah. so it wasn't, um, I, I like to sort of run things <laughs> um, as an independent producer. And so I had my own ideas about like how, what I wanted to do and it differed from theirs. So, um, you know, they, they tweaked their model, they hired Effie who further, you know, changed things and brought her amazing stamp to the new incarnation of the company. Um, and Effie and I are friends actually. And so we're always talking to each other and, and trying to figure out what we can do together. But yeah, I just, we just felt, I just felt it was time to move on. And, but the main thing is I missed like producing hands-on, yeah. you know, I liked being a financier, um, but you know, my most uh, rewarding experiences at Game Changer were Land Ho and The Tale, films that I was actually much more hands-on. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's hard to do that and run a film fund at the same time, you know? Um, like I could go to Iceland, right? With, yeah. with Land Ho. So, um, so that's why I decided to uh, launch the population with Molly and Derek and, and kind of just kind of set our own pace and figure out our own. And model. how do the three of you, I mean, because Molly's also worked on Nomadland, for instance. And yeah. that's not, was that through the population or that was separate? No. Yeah. That was separate. That was separate. That yeah. was because um, how do the three of you collaborate and why do you sort of get along? Yeah, Please. well, Derek, Derek was my right hand at Game Changer, you know, yeah. um, and so we had a working relationship. And then when Derek went off to make his de directorial debut, uh, he made a film called The Housemaid in Vietnam. Um, Molly Asher basically substituted uh, for him for a year and then we got along. So we all worked together at Game Changer. And um, and yeah, so that we decided to like continue working together. Um, and then, so now at the population, um, we we thankfully got a first look deal from Topic Studios hmm. uh, that just started at the top of the year for feature film, TV and uh, uh, podcasts. And so uh, I bought projects that I'd been developing to, you know, uh, Molly brought her projects that she'd been developing and same with Derek. So we just kind of all brought our projects into the company together. And so now we're all sort of, um, you know, like it, so I'll be lead producer in some projects and they'll be executive producers and vice versa. Yeah. And was Swallow through the population or that was separate? That was separate because it, but th that was Molly and my first collaboration outside of Game Changer. Like okay. Molly and I produce, were lead producers together on that, but we, we sort of, um, it was actually th partly through that experience that we thought, oh, well, let's just keep working together, you know? So the population grew out of both Game Changer and Swallow. Um, okay. And uh, we decided to put the population label on it after the fact, you know, but yeah. Um, Swallow, I, I love, but it's one of those songs that's kind of hard to pin down. Um, yeah. Genre turn. I mean, was that hard to finance? It was the hardest film I've ever had to finance I look for financing for I mean it was a small budget it was a million dollar budget but you know I ended up Molly and I both ended up finding I think I added it up one one time it was like 5.7 million dollars worth of financing from all these various financiers but none of them were for full full financing and none of the pieces fit together because every financier wanted um they had their own stipulations you yeah. know everybody wanted to be last in first out they wanted to you know put an actor in there that we couldn't really get into. Um, there were all these conditions. 
it was very, very frustrating. And, and it was hard because exactly because of what you said, the tone is weird. Like it's, it's outside the box. It doesn't fit into an algorithm. And so people didn't really know what to make of it. It's like, is it an art house film? Is it a horror film? Is it a draw? Like, what is it? You know? Um, so it was very challenging. But you got it made. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and what about I Carry You With Me, which is so beautiful. And um, yeah. hopefully this interview is going to come out the week of the U.S. release. For that oh, film. good. May 21st. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> this is Heidi Ewing, um, great documentarian who is moving into the fiction side. Um, what was the challenge? I mean, that film looks challenging to produce. Um, yeah. What were the challenges of, you know, helping Heidi move from nonfiction to fiction with that, that film? You know, she, she her documentaries are so you can tell that she has a great great eye. Like her visuals are beautiful, so I had no worries about that whatsoever. Um, the, her biggest fear, and as, as well as mine, was just her ability to like work with actors. Um, and uh, but that turned out to be she ended up being great at it because because of doing documentaries all these years, she had an ear for realistic dialogue. You know, and she worked closely with the actors and they contributed a lot and made the, um, the, the sort of the dialogue come alive and, and be more realistic. And, um, and she, her Spanish is great, but she's not a native speaker. And yeah. so the actors added a lot of sort of uh, specificity um, to it, called regional Mexican specificity to it. Um, and so she did great with, with the actors, but it was so funny because she was especially a uh, afraid of working with the kid, the child actor. She's like, what do I tell them? How do I direct them? <laughs> and uh, so she was like very fearful, but the, the child performances in it are really great too. So I'm very- yeah, amazing performances and just, yeah, a beautiful sort of restraint to the storytelling. I'm yeah, sure. yeah, for sure. But you know, it's funny cause like this is her first, this is her debut feature, if, scripted feature. The Tale was Jennifer Fox's uh, debut yes. feature. So I worked with two documentarians on their first feature. So I kind of see it, it, it they, they have a different brain, you know, it's a different way of thinking. And it's, um, but, but I learned a lot from both of them because it's sort of like, uh, as a narrative um, producer, I'm, I'm pretty rigid. I'm like, okay, I want everything planned. Like everybody has to be on time. We can't you know, go off schedule. Um, but, you know, documentarians, they find the story. They kind of let the story come to them. And so uh, they, they're they like, keep, let's keep shooting. You know, let's get that. Let's get this. Maybe we'll find something, you know, they have, they find the poetry. And so I learned to be more flexible by working with them. Okay. And uh, yeah, so that was, that was great. Yeah, but at the end of the day, you also have to say no more shooting days. No, yeah, you're not you're not finding anything else or discovering anything else. You've got yeah, one more I week. Know. Yeah, I know. But you know, it, it was it it was a challenge to, you know, with each director that I work with, you adapt to the way they work. You know, you figure out how they work and you and you try to enable them as best as you can. You know, Heidi works a certain way. She likes to have flexibility. Um, she likes to be able to have enough time at the end of the day to grab something that she sees that she that you know you can't plan that you can't plan right. So, so you know, we had a big contingency. We we built in time at the end of the day. Like uh, we made sure to capture all the magic hours, like schedule. She loved, you know, wanted to shoot magic hour, every magic hour we wanted to shoot. So we had to figure out how to schedule the scenes for that. Um, but it's just figuring out their style and what they want and, and trying to accommodate as best you can. Mm. And how would you say you as a producer can balance the really creative side with the really logistical, the finance, the paperwork? I mean, do you enjoy all parts of producing or are there some parts you just sort of struggle through and hate, but you get them done so you can do the parts you like? Of course, there are parts that are really annoying, like, you know, um, accounting, <laughs> tax accounting every year is super annoying. Um, delivery can be a drag, you know, uh, redlining contracts can be boring, but you know, but I love negotiating deals. I love like, I do love how it all comes together and problem solving really producing is problem solving. So it's like, okay, how, how do you um, figure out how to do this crazy creative idea within the limitations that you have, you know, the budgetary and logistical limitations. So I enjoy those challenges and, and I get a lot of joy out of um, like figuring stuff out. Yeah. One thing I love about being your Facebook friend is um, you talk about producers and then producers. <laughs> um, and that's in air quotes, if anybody's just listening. Um, 
can you tell us a little bit about what you mean? Because I think I know, um, but just, yeah, explain yeah. the sort of sharks around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is, everybody thinks they're a producer. Um, and it, the producers who are actually producers, and I'm not talking about, by the way, I hate this term creative producer because it's just, it's a, that's just one aspect of what we do, like being the director's partner and helping them make creative decisions. That's just one piece of it. Like I said, there's creativity in deal making, you know, there's creativity in figuring out how to budget something. Um, there's creativity in marketing and distribution. I like, I love all of that stuff. So, but it's not creative per se. So it is a real marriage of business and creative. So I think a capital P producer is somebody who does all the business and creative aspects soup to nuts and kind of leads the charge overall, um, sees the big picture. It's the, it's the person who sees the big picture. And I think a lot of people in this industry think that making a couple of phone calls or writing a check is producing, you know, um, it's not, you know, try producing a movie soup to nuts and you'll realize that like, that's not producing. And I think that like financiers are asking for producer credits, actors are asking for producer credits because they want the best picture awards, you know? Um, so it's really kind of become this like catch all for everything. And I think, I think it stems mainly from a misunderstanding of what real producers do um, because it's such a hard job and it's getting harder that few people actually do it, you know? Yeah. So very, very few of us who actually do it understand there's very few of us um, we, uh, who understand really what that means. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I sometimes ask people in the, these interviews, what do people misunderstand about what a producer does? Either, you know, your family or people in this industry. Do you think it's that they misunderstand that it is the big picture? It's the whole job for 10 years. It's not, you know, sitting, holding a director's hand on set for a few weeks. Yeah, I, it's misunderstood because it's like a lot of the stuff we do is invisible, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's not acting, it's not writing, it's not directing, those things are very clear, you know, it's, it's all the stuff in between, it's like putting, it's the glue in between all of those things, um, and so it's just hard to see, um, and so I, you know, I think that's why I use my social media a lot to try to educate people as to what a producer actually does. And, um, but it's still, it's, it's, it, you know, even before I became a producer, I didn't really understand, you know, it's one of those things where it's until you do it, you just don't, it's hard to understand what it is. Yeah. Do you ever teach producing anywhere? I'm a terrible teacher. <laughs> I I, no, I think you would be a great teacher. Oh, well, I'm too lazy to put together lesson plans. <laughs> so. Okay, not yet. But <laughs> you, you know, your old buddies from NYU need to get get you in. Um, I've been asked. I've been asked to teach, but I um, I prefer making movies. Maybe when I get a, a bit older, and I, yeah. I, you know, yeah, I'll teach. Um, and can you tell us while we're being, you know, so serious about, you know, if we're talking about production and sets, what are your pet peeves on a set? how filthy they are. <laughs> um, filthy you know as in no, just dust like, and dirt? <laughs> dirty. I'm a, okay. a bit of a germaphobe. And so oh. Well, yeah. you're living in the right pandemic. Exactly. So, yeah. Yes, yes. yes. It's <laughs> but yeah, I mean, what other pet peeves? Well, one huge pet peeve is whenever I walk onto a set on day one of shooting everyone assumes that I am a PA or the director's assistant or um but I get a kick out of telling them that no I'm the producer yeah. <laughs> and they just have this fear in their eyes um so that's fun yeah you're not the first woman to tell me that um yeah. in this series even and it's not many people yet I'm sure yes um you've worked with a lot of great women directors, a lot of great people of color, um, a, a lot of Asian American talents. Um, does it feel like things are getting better to support inclusion in this industry or is it still a, a big fight? It does feel like things are getting slightly better because I do think that there are executives and, and companies, studios who are like are susceptible to public pressure. And there is a, there's been, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement, with all this um, talk about anti-Asian violence, like there is 
I, I, they are they're impacted by those things, those societal forces. And so um, I think even if it's just for uh, mercenary reasons or for just like public per perception, like they'll green light more black projects or green light more Asian projects. Um, but, uh, and also the big thing is that, you know, the executives making these green light decisions, they're becoming more diversified. So like, for example, I Carry You With Me was, it's a Mexican, it's a film about Mexican uh, immigrant, undocumented immigrants. And um, it was championed by this executive, Alex Zahn at Sony Worldwide, who wanted to launch this, who launched this Latino initiative, Latino film initiative. And so he really championed the film. It's a Spanish language film with, with no like known American actors in it. And so without him, this film, I don't think would have gotten made. Um, and then similarly, uh, a project of mine that hasn't been announced yet, but it was, it's an Asian American project that uh, was greenlit by an Asian American executive. So um, like, I think change is slowly, slowly happening. Good. And you know what, even if people are doing it for the wrong reasons to sort of say they're virtuous when they're not, at least virtuous things get made. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And then, and then we have it. And then they have a chance to prove themselves in the marketplace and hopefully yeah. more virtuous things will get made. Yeah. Um, so yeah, without revealing anything um, that won't be out in the first week of May, um, you know, can you tell us what you're working on on now? Um, well, we have a, the population has a film in post-production that Molly Asher is lead producer on. It's called Catch the Fair One um, by Joe Vladica. Um, and that hopefully will premiere this year sometime. Um, and then um, I Carry You With Me, obviously we'll open in theaters May 21st in New York and LA and then expand. This is the fifth postponed date. <laughs> we were supposed to release last June and then Sony Classics kept pushing the, the release date. Um, I've got two feature films, uh, one of which um, has Lucy Liu and Lana Condor attached to it that were hoping to shoot sometime this year. It's called Rosemead. Um, that was announced a few months ago and uh, it's based on a true story. And then uh, I have another Mexican film. I love shooting in Mexico so much that I, I, I wanna go back, but it's a film called The Huntress that was also just announced by a debut director named Suzanne Andrews Correa. And it's a, a set in the, um, it's basically a, a story about a woman's fight against the violence against women in Juarez, Mexico. Wow. It sounds like amazing projects. Um, if you had to say, I mean, what makes a film right for you to produce? And I know it's a case by case and it might be a gut thing, but can you put that into words at all? It is a gut thing, <laughs> but um, it's hard. I mean, I, th I, I like films that are character driven and filmmaker driven, you know, that have a, have a clear filmmaker's vision to them. Um, I tend to gravitate toward, uh, actually I like all genres, but lately I've been gravitating toward true stories. Um, and, uh, you know, cause I, I like dramas and it's really hard to do a drama unless you can kind of, unless it's based on a true story actually, hmm. to be honest. And um, I also like horror, genre movies. I like horror movies quite a bit, um, I, but I, because they're both entertaining and also oftentimes horror movies comment on society in a way. Yeah. So I do like films that, I wouldn't say I like issue films, but like I do, I mean, every film is political and I see politics in every film that I produce, um, even if it may not be overt, um, but you know, but always grounded in, a, in, in humans, in characters. Um, so I hope that's, it's pretty general, but you know, no, I think that really sums up quite well if we look back on your career, this sort of, yeah, they're bringing up things, smart things to talk about, filmmaker-driven, yes. character-driven. Yeah, they, they have some meat on the bones. Um, yeah, even if very entertaining. Yeah, yeah. And also it's, it's sort of an urgency, like a why now, you know, like why is this, so it does comment on something in society um, that's, that's, that's sort of in the zeitgeist, I guess. Amazing, Manette, thank you so much for joining us and giving us a little taste of the producer's life behind the scenes. Um, uh, so many amazing films you've worked on and you have kept up the good fight, not being one of those producers in quotes, but being <laughs> a producer, no quotes. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much. And we can't wait to see the next films and good luck with I Carry You With Me's launch. Thanks so much, Wendy.